starting off with some gratitude tonight. Grateful each and every one of you are here. That was our buffer song because the live stream is going and the global branch is in the house with us tonight. Let's give them a shout out, a welcome, and some love. If you are the global branch and watching online, feel free to share the live stream. Those of you here in the chapel, if you would like to make yourself a little more comfy cozy in this time together, please feel free to move around and uh, make yourself more comfortable. Help yourself to a hot cup of tea or coffee from the back corner there. If you're here for the first time, thank you for making your way here. We would love to hear from you via the newcomer cards that are on little clipboards around the space. So if you'd like to share your info and thoughts with us there, and then place it in the offering bags later on in our time together. We would love that. Also, during this next song, you're welcome to add your voice, your breath, your energy, of course, as you would like. My name's Heather Lynn, pronouns are she, they, and um, I'm so glad you're here. be about. Amen? Amen. Amen. Mary Jo here to welcome us. Hi, I'm Mary Jo. My pronouns are she, her. Every month is Black History Month. Amen. 
Black history is world history. Amen. One of the ways we can honor black history is by educating ourselves. I have a few points of education regarding our black immigrant siblings. The number of black immigrants is growing at a faster rate in Colorado than in any other state. 70% of black immigrants who have contact with the police end up in detention. Bond amounts for black immigrants are about 55% higher than for non-black immigrants, and most black immigrants are incarcerated indefinitely by, in ICE detention centers. But just because it's called a detention center, make no mistake, a cage is a cage. Here at ECC, we believe in the expansive and abundant love of God. We choose to show an expansive and abundant love to our immigrant siblings, not only because the Bible tells us to, which it does, but also because we are always working toward community. One of the ways we live in community is to share our ethos together at the beginning of every service. Married, divorced, and single here, it's one family that mingles here. Conservative and liberal here, we've all got to give a little here. Big and small here, there is room for us all here. Doubt and believe here, we all can receive here. LGBTQ plus and straight here, there is no hate here. Woman, non-binary, and man here, everyone can here. Whatever your race here, for all of us, grace here. In imitation of the ridiculous love Almighty God has for each of us and all of us, let us live and love without labels. Amen. Thank you, Mary Jo. Let's stand together as each is able and willing. And of course, every invitation that someone up here offers you is exactly that. It's an invitation. So mostly you are welcome to be exactly as you are, exactly as you need to be. And, um, and so if that means remaining seated so that you can be more present, that is totally cool. Um, we stand together as a sign of practicing presence together as compassionate witnesses to all that arises, even as we hear about injustice in our world. And I believe that it is good for us to, as we take in that information, as we face any injustice, we ask God who is love to lead us, to guide us, to give us wisdom from within and without, amen? So as we sing this song, let's ask God who is love to be our very breath, to be the very essence of our existence and our comings and our goings and in all states of being, whether they be positive or negative. Amen? Amen.
God, we pray that you would make known to us and help us remove any barriers to your love that we may have within us. And so many of us do, I think all of us do, because of the way the world seeks to shape our minds. We sometimes have a hard time believing and trusting that your love is as great and vast and expansive and inclusive as it is. And, and I think for so many of us here, we can believe that it is for others, but we struggle the most to believe that your love is that good for us, for our own selves. So help us to see where we can invite your love to bring kindness to our own selves, compassion to our own selves, bring that healing to our cells and to our bones and to our thought patterns. Come to us, Holy Spirit, and do your beautiful, beautiful work, your beautiful, persistent work, inviting us to receive your blessings, inviting us to receive your peace, your guidance, your wisdom, and your grace. Come now, fount of every blessing. Tune our hearts to sing thy grace. Come now, fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for souls of loudest praise. Teach me.
Peace. You can always clap whenever you feel moved to. Always. Always welcome to. Yes, the peace of Christ, dear ones, to you. The peace of Christ to your hearts, minds, bodies, and spirits. Let's share a sign of Christ's peace together tonight, greeting one another in the name of love. Hey, Global Branch. Peace, peace, peace. Lots of love. If you haven't already said hello and maybe even where you're tuning in from, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, when you say hello, that's how we know you're here so we can welcome you. One of our Global Branch greeters will do that. And then of course, we might be very familiar with each other and know where in the world you live and where you're joining in this virtual space, but sometimes it's nice to mention where you're where you are in the world, so that others who might be new to this, the chat, uh, can be more aware of how truly global uh, this segment of our community is. It's pretty cool. Um, you can hear it's a lively room tonight. It feels really good. The sun is still out, so it's nice that the days are getting a little bit longer. It feels really, really nice. And Paula is momentarily going to be sharing with us a message as we continue our series in the Gospel of John, which is probably my favorite gospel. It's such a good one. I mean, they're all really, really good. You can't really, can't really rate the gospels. You can like do comparative studies on them, but you can't really rate them because they're all no. great and they all have something to offer. I'm, I am partial to John. Uh, yeah, I think I am too. I always the have been since I was a kid. There was something yeah. about the whole notion of in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word mm. was God. It wasn't, it was right away the more mystical part yeah. of religion. Mm -hmm. And you know, so much of the last 500 years has tried to demystify Christianity. Yeah. And it's like, oh folks, you can't do that. Not really. Yeah. It's really mystical. It always has been, always will be. And yeah. John really gravitates toward that. Yeah. We're having a nice intellectual discussion here. Just yeah. talk amongst the, yourselves. The global branch just heard us, but what I was saying is that you can't. You can do comparative studies of the gospel, but you can't really rate them because they're all good and they all have something to offer. But I think we resonate with John the I most because of the mysticism. Really and, like John. I yeah. know Nicole, one of our pastors, really likes Luke. Yeah. Um, she's not even listening to me. She has no idea I even said that. <laughs> See, she doesn't even know. She has no idea what yes. I said. Yes. About her, yes. Yeah, okay, you were distracted. It's all right. You're, you're, you're allowed to be a little yeah. distracted, I suppose. We're allowed to have favorite gospels. That's the point, I guess. I, yep. yep. It's, it's true. Um, so, yes. Um, tonight is going to be a little different message than I normally give. And I preach three out of four weeks here at uh, Envision Community Church. So, uh, yeah, those of you who are new or not here all that often, it's like, Wow, that's well, okay. That was interesting. Well, maybe it wasn't interesting. So here's the deal. In my entire life, I've had exactly two dogs. Got the first dog when my youngest daughter, Jaina, was 10 years of age. Harvey was his name. And Harvey was a golden retriever. He was an AKC registered golden retriever. And the first four years of his life, he was not a particularly good dog because we had no idea what we were doing. He had no idea how to train a dog. Then when he was four, he took a big chunk out of Jaina's hand because she she wasn't feeding him fast enough. And I said, oh, you know what? I need to figure out how to train this dog. So I trained him and we trained him extremely well. And when it came time to eat, he knew that he had to stay on one side of the room while I put his food in the dish and that he could not move in the direction of that dish, not even in the direction of it until I said, okay. And then another step beyond that, Jaina was the only one who fed him. It's like, yeah, you take a bite out of her hand, watch what happens to you. So for quite Sometime I mean, for years, Jaina was the only one who would feed him. She would feed him, and she would just make him wait. And sometimes 30 seconds, sometimes three or four minutes, he would just stare at the food until you said, okay. So one day I come home from work. I go in the backyard. Here is the food dish full on one side of the backyard. Here's Harvey on the other side just staring at the dish. 
And Jane is sitting back chuckling because two blue jays are just attacking Harvey's head. And he's just, but he will not move. And I said, oh, Jane, no, 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 that's, that's not how this works. And she said, okay. And so he ran to the food. It's, we love that dog, but not like I love Lily. Lily was an angel, I'm pretty sure. Lily was a mutt. She was a golden retriever and border collie mix. And because she was a golden retriever and a border collie mix, uh, she was neurotic but happy about it. <laughs> you know, that's kind of a golden retriever. Border collie mix would have that personality. She, we taught to bark one single time when somebody came to the door. And she would bark one single time when people came to the door, unless it was me returning, or unless it was JL's boyfriend, Roberto, who for whatever reason she adored. And then she would start crying when she heard the car come down the street because she knew the difference between that car and any other car, and she would cry until they finally got to the door, and then she would bark once to let us know they were there. Lily ran with me five days a week for 13 years. She ran with me the last week of her life. She had a tumor in her uh, digestive system, and it was a scheduled surgery, and the surgery went okay, but she died two days later, and then it was really, really hard because it turned out that the tumor had been benign. And we all missed her so, so, so very much. But now, I have three children. I have five grandchildren. I like the grandchild thing because they come, they visit. I'll have all five granddaughters this week. They're all between 11 and 15 years of age. And, and they all come and then they go. And you don't have to pay for their medical care and you don't have to pay for their college education. It's a marvelous thing, this grandparenting. So I decided to do it with dogs. And so for four years now, I've been pretty close to Finn. Finn Sykes is seven years old. I've known Finn since she was three. Finn is a peculiar dog. She's a mutt. At the time that Christy got her, she thought she was a beagle. I don't think there's any beagle in her, right? There's yeah, zero beagle in her. There are, I think, about, uh, I don't know, 13 or 14 other things that she is. I adore this dog. So I often keep Finn when Christy and Mara go out of town, but a couple of weeks ago, it's been a while, so I said, hey, can I just keep her? And they said, yeah, so I picked her up on a Friday night, and Christy gave me a, a big bag of food, and she said, this should take her through Wednesday when you're going to bring her back. So I called on Wednesday, and I said, um, I don't really want to bring her back today. I really kind of would just like to keep her and maybe keep her to Saturday. And she said, Polly, you do not have enough food to Saturday. And I said, I have plenty of food. It will not be an issue. I can get her through Saturday, no problem. So I brought her back Saturday, and I walk in with the food, still in the bag, a fair amount of food. And Christy looks at the bag and then looks at the dog and said, Finn, how did you like fat camp at Paula's house? <laughs> I said, I, I, I fed her. I fed her every day. I fed her appropriately. She ran with me every day. She ran eight days in a row. And we did walk for like an hour, uh, two of those days. And I gave her lots and lots of broccoli and lots and lots of carrots. And oh my God, I had your dog at fat camp. <laughs> That's, I felt just terrible. But both Lily and Finn do not like it when I get ready to go. With Lily, I traveled a lot back in that day, and as soon as I would get out my suitcase, Lily would get all upset. We finally learned not to take the suitcase out until immediately before I left, and then she would pout as soon as she saw that suitcase. Finn has figured out if I take a shower, that I'm going to leave afterwards. Now, we're not gonna talk about, you know, how often I shower, but she knows if I'm showering, immediately after that, I'm likely leaving, and so she goes into the walk-in closet, lies down, puts her head down, and she is not happy. And she reluctantly follows me to the door. I leave. She reluctant, only because I'm going to give her a treat does she follow me to the door. I leave. I come back. I can come back three minutes later. I can come back five hours later. The response is the same. She treats me as if she was quite sure she was never going to see me ever, ever again. In Finn's case, she bounces straight up and down. Many of you have seen her do this. It's quite peculiar. All four legs, she just woo, woo, just, just straight up, straight down, straight up, straight down. She gets a little bit too full of herself. I adore that dog. I'm very partial to dogs because a lot of humans are. I will do a sermon that talks a lot about cats. Sometime. I will. I had a cat once, I mean, coot cat, but did you know that dogs have been domesticated for 30,000 years? Dogs have been domesticated 10,000 years longer than any other animal. Horses are next 20,000 years ago. And dogs have evolved along with us. 
Studies were done not long ago, and I got to watch a study of this, and it's so sad. And they brought six or seven different breeds of puppy, and they were training the puppies in one single day to be able to do a trick and get a treat. But they also were training the same age wolf pups. And by the end of three or four hours, didn't matter which breed it was of dog, the dog was able to follow instructions, do exactly as it was told, and get the treat. And the poor wolf pup was exactly where it began, clueless, utterly incapable of learning what it was being taught because wolves did not evolve along with us. Dogs evolved along with us. Why do we love our dogs so much? Because a dog loves you unconditionally. You can even be a really lousy parent to a dog. The dog doesn't care. The dog loves you anyway. And one good thing about humans, when we know we are loved unconditionally, that is when we're, in, when we're inclined to love unconditionally. So we know that our dogs love us without condition, and so we are willing to love our dogs without condition. So in the first century, at the time of Christ, there were dogs around, particularly as sheepdogs. It wasn't unusual for a shepherd to have one or two sheepdogs, but that was not the animal of that culture. The animal of that culture was sheep. And much like New Zealand today, where there are more sheep than people, sheep were kept from the beginning of their life to the end of their life. They were not used for food. They were only used for their wool. And sheep were adored by humans, and humans were adored by sheep. Working as a shepherd was the most difficult task in the entire world of Palestine. It was not a real respected role, but it also was an extremely difficult role. Because if you were a shepherd, you were working with your flock of sheep 24-7, 365 days a year. Think of a dairy farmer today. You were, in fact, constantly with your sheep. As a shepherd in that day, you had very minimal clothing that was all made of wool that came from your sheep. You carried with you a rod. The rod had a large piece of wood at the end of it that was embedded with metal to keep away the predators, primarily wolves in that environment. You also had a staff. The staff had a crook on the end where you could pull a sheep to you, but the main purpose of the staff, and the sheep knew it, was for the staff to be held out horizontally as the sheep came into the pen in the evening. And when the staff was held horizontally, the sheep were so well trained that they knew to only come through one at a time and to not move through until the previous sheep had been allowed to move on. Because that's the one time that the shepherd was checking the sheep to make sure the sheep were all healthy, eating properly, had not been harmed during the day. Was it unusual for the older sheep to have a difficult time grazing as animals normally graze? It would be more difficult for them to reach all the way to the ground. And so when the shepherd would see that one of the sheep was losing weight, he actually had built a table, a low table. And that table, food was put on just for the older sheep so that they didn't have to reach way down to get their food grazing, but they were able to eat it more at a head level. And so he would know whether to send the sheep there or to another area. The only other thing he carried was a sling, and the sling was never to hit the sheep with. It was always to take a rock and put it in front of the sheep to tell it which way to go if, in fact, he did not have a sheepdog. They never got any time off unless they were in town. If a shepherd was in town, then all of the sheep would be brought into a pen that was in the town. That particular pen would have very high walls, keeping predators out. It also had an official gate, a real gate that you opened and closed. And one of the shepherds, the shepherds would take turns, and one shepherd each night would take care of that gate. All the shepherds would bring all their sheep into the pen. First thing in the morning, each shepherd would come back, step into the pen, and he would not even need to use words. He would just make a sound with his voice, and his sheep knew it was his voice. And they would follow him out of the enclosure. And if there was a recalcin recalcitrant sheep or two, he would call them by name, and immediately they would come running. That was their only break, is if they were in town. If they were not in town, then they were using sheep enclosures that had been around for centuries. They were low, rock, round enclosures that kept the sheep in but did not keep predators out. They had an opening, but they had no gate. So the shepherd would lie at the opening. The opening was about four feet wide, and he would sleep there all night long just to keep the sheep 
in. This was the life of a shepherd. And how did the people of Israel feel about shepherds? I know how God felt about shepherds because it was to shepherds that the birth of Christ was revealed. Shepherds, the lowest of the low, were understood by the culture to be among the most loving humans that existed. So it's no surprise then when Jesus speaks about sheep in the same way you and I might speak about our dogs. And here's what he has to say in the 10th chapter of the Gospel of John. I tell you the truth. The man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way as a thief and a robber. So now he's talking about the sheep staying in town at night. The man who enters by the gate, that's the shepherd of his sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought all, out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. You know, it's interesting, during World War I, soldiers would steal the sheep at night from the pen, and then they would move away with the sheep. The shepherd would wake up, hear the sheep, and call, and the soldiers would watch the sheep turn around and run toward the shepherd, and it happened so often that soldiers stopped trying to steal sheep. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize his voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. All whoever come before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I'm the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved, which is everybody, by the way. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. This brought all the listeners of Jesus back to that one psalm they had learned just as many of us learned it when they were children. Psalm 23. It's a psalm of David. David himself was a shepherd, a shepherd who took care of his sheep, who knew how to care for his sheep, was very effective with his sling. But then he grew up through the ranks until he finally became the king of Israel. And like so, ha so often happens when people gain absolute power, it corrupts them absolutely. And David was corrupted absolutely. So much so that at one point of his boring but powerful life, he's looking out the palace window and he looks across the city and at the top of another building, he sees a woman bathing. Bathsheba is her name. He sends his servants for her and brings her back. And the very absolute best we possibly could hope for with this story is that when she comes back, he's kind to her, he woos her, he tries to get her affection, that he romances her until finally they come together. This is the best we can hope for. And even in that circumstance, notice the power differential that actually never would have made it okay. The king and the servant girl. That's the best we possibly can hope for. It's also equally possible that he just said, I want that one, and they went and got that one, and he proceeded to rape her. We don't know. But the truth is, whatever it was, it wasn't okay. Both of them were married. And it wasn't long before Bathsheba was pregnant. Things get worse. David, trying to make sure things worked out okay for him, decides to take her husband, Uriah the Hittite, who was in fact a soldier and an officer in his army, and give him a weekend leave with his wife. He thinks this will work, they'll be intimate together, everybody will assume the child is his. But he is such a good officer, he refuses to sleep with his wife if his soldiers don't also have an opportunity for leave to sleep with their wives. So once again, two weeks later, he invites him back and says, he can go ahead and enjoy the weekend with his wife, but again, he does not sleep with his wife, so now he's really got himself a problem. So what does David do? He puts Uriah on the front lines of a great battle so that he is one of the first soldiers killed. 
And that way, when it's clear that his wife is pregnant, well, it will just be assumed that it was his child. It is utterly, completely awful. He ends up marrying her. And somewhere between then and the end of his life, David finally has his reckoning. Some people with a lot of power don't ever wake up to the reality of who they are. And it is not good. Some do. It's rare that people in great positions of power do wake up to the weaknesses they have, to the evil they have brought on the world. Usually, something has to bring them down. Something has to shock them into an awareness of who they have become. In his case, it was the death of three of his sons and then the death of this child, Bathsheba's child, just seven days after birth. All kinds of things go wrong for David, and he finally comes to see the error of his ways. You know, I was talking to Christy this afternoon, and I said, it's really interesting. As a powerful white man, I could tell you exactly what my strengths were because people always affirmed my strengths. But I was never called out on my shit. Because I was a person of great power, men often get a free pass for the weaknesses of their personality. Unless they have a particular kind of personality or a really good spouse, they end up not really seeing their shadow sides. And it really wasn't until I transitioned before I began to see all of my shadow sides in their clarity. And oh my goodness, it has been humbling to the extreme. It was worse than that for David. He came to see what an utter scoundrel he had been. And he completely and utterly repents. How do we know that's because we find out later that he was a man after God's own heart. That he came to see just how awful he had been, just how awful he had treated people, and came to love God. And we don't know exactly when this psalm was written, but one line in the psalm makes us think it might have been written after he had come to see this truth about himself. And so let's listen to that psalm we know so well. The 23rd psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in need of anything. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides quiet waters. He restores my soul. Oh, how David needed his soul restored. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake, also a great need in David's life. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, because he had known failure, finally known the loss of his beloved children, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. That would be the reference to that table that was built up so those who were older, those who were infirm, would be able to eat and know that they could eat without a digestive difficulty. That's the one line that makes us think that he might have been a little bit older. I love the fact that from the time I first met Finn, Finn is fed every day with a turned upside down colander at Christie's house. That you know, when I first saw it, I thought to myself, do you wanna eat pasta at this house? I'm not real sure about that. <laughs> Because this colander, I learned, has one single purpose. It's turned upside down, and Finn's bowl is put on it. And so Finn is able to eat at head level. That is how much she loves her dog. I always get the colander when the dog comes to my house. I always return the colander, though I tend not to return the bed. Because when you really love someone or something, you always tend to hang on to something, some part of it, because you really don't want them to leave. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. In other words, I'm cared for by you, even in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, also unusual, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Many shepherds in the first century did have sheepdogs, usually one, sometimes two. 
In the history of Israel, people often had sheepdogs, many times one, sometimes two, and throughout the history of Christianity, post-Jesus, shepherds often have one, sometimes two, sheepdogs. So from the time of the Hebrew scriptures, do you know what the most common names chosen are for the two sheepdogs? Once the sheep have been gathered by the dogs and they know the dog knows the sheep are headed into the pen, the dogs walk slowly behind them. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And yes, one of the most common names chosen for sheepdogs is goodness and mercy. Will you pray with me? God, may we learn from those who love us unconditionally that they are, in fact, with their sometimes sad eyes and their hungry little mouths, they are the, the one living thing that shows us how much you love us unconditionally. And may we love unconditionally as we have been loved. May we do that regardless and just like we know we are loved, regardless. And may goodness and mercy follow us all the days of our lives. Amen. me to lie down in green pastures, leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul and leads me in right paths for goodness sake. darkest valley I fear no evil for you are with me your guiding rod and staff they comfort they comfort me A table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy. my whole life long down in green pastures my whole life long beside the still waters my whole life long he restores my soul my whole life long my cup overflows my whole life long the Lord I 
Such a beautiful blessing and affirmation that I find nourishes my trust and faith and courage. Thank you, Paula. That was a neat sermon. That was neat. You said it was going to be different, and it was, it was cool. Uh, offering. Let's worship together now with our gifts and our offerings. Uh, I think, so it's, Christy, is it envisioncommunitychurch.org slash give that has the info on giving? Not yet. Is it lefthandchurch.org slash give then? Yeah. Okay, awesome. So lefthandchurch.org slash give. As we are in transition, all the things are in process. There you can find all of the ways to give if you would like to check them out and find out what's most convenient for you. Of course, in this room, some offering bags are being passed around. Um, again, if you're here for the first time and you have a newcomer card, you can place that in there as well. If you'd like to set up a recurring gift at lefthandchurch.org slash give, you could do that. That would be amazing. That helps us project, envision, future, oh, oh envision. Um, yeah, that wasn't super clever, but, you know, I tried to be cute at least. Um, okay, and then paypal.me slash lefthandchurch. <laughs> Or if you'd like to text a donation, a one-time donation, you can text that now to the number 84321. All right. Thanks, Heather Lynn. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so based on Paula's sermon, I'd like to make a very late in the game name suggestion for our church. <laughs> Enfinshin <laughs> Community Church. Then we'd have a mascot. We could just have a logo that's a picture of Finn. Yeah, I don't think, you know, Grace might get jealous, but I think it would be very cute. Um, I have always loved the name the Hound of Heaven for God, and I can totally get behind this nickname for Finn, too, because Finn really is the goodest girl. But actually, when I hear the story of the Good Shepherd here at ECC, I go straight back to Christmas Eve two years ago. As we do every Christmas Eve, we had asked several of you to read part of the scripture accounting the birth of Jesus. And the first reader, who shall remain unnamed, went first and was reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, and he got to verse 8, and he read, And there were sheep herds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flock at night. And we all sort of tilted our head and thought, Maybe he's going for like an old English flair kind of thing. Or if you're like me and you have an internal critic, you went, maybe I've been mispronouncing sheep herd this whole time. And then a really sweet example of good sheep herd-esque love happened. Cameron McKay came to the podium next and he got to verse 15 and he reflexively read it like this. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the sheep herds said to one another, let us go to Bethlehem. And afterwards, he came up to me and he said, well, I wasn't sure, but I figured it would be best to follow and support. <laughs> and I like to think that our good shepherd, our hound of heaven, is exactly like this. He's not coming after to correct us. He's not coming after us to tell us we did something wrong but coming after us to support us, hounding us down to show us some love, inviting us endlessly into God's fold and inviting us back again and again to God's table as God does right here tonight in this invitation to communion and community. For on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he had gathered his disciples together to celebrate the annual Passover feast. He took the bread and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, this is my body broken for you. Take, eat, and remember me. Later the same evening, he took the cup and he blessed it, saying, this wine is the blood of a new covenant, a promise for the redemption of all people. Take, drink, and remember me. At this church, we have a truly open table during communion. Everyone without exception is invited to come forward to receive the bread and gluten-free crackers and grape juice, which for us represent the body and blood of Christ. 
If you choose not to commune, that's perfectly okay too. You're welcome to remain seated. Paula will be off to the side here if you'd like a blessing or have a short prayer request. There's also a bank of candles in the back if you'd like to light one. And there's a prayer journal with the pastors do read throughout the week and pray for. And if you're joining us virtually here tonight, we invite you to take whatever elements you have and perhaps share in the comments what they are. And for those of you who are with us in person today, we invite you to come forward as you're ready, remembering that this is Christ's body broken for you and Christ's blood shed for you. Was a preacher, and she was his wife. Just trying to make the world a little better, you know, shine a light. And people started talking just to hear their own voice. But those people tried to accuse my father, said he made the wrong choice. And though it might be painful. Time will always tell Those people have long since gone My father never fell Even when the rain falls Even when the flood starts rising Even when the storm comes I am washed by the water Even when the rain falls even when the flood starts rising, even when the storm comes, I am washed by the water. Even if the earth crumbles under my feet, even if the ones I love turn around and crucify me, I won't ever, ever let you down. Let's do announcements. Okay, we're going to do announcements. Let's do announcements. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Here we are. <laughs> you ready for some announcements? <laughs> my name is Tanya. My pronouns are she, her. Um, announcement for this evening, right after this service, um, our February community social will be here uh, after the service tonight. We will be discussing uh, Brene Brown's interview with Richard Rohr from her podcast, Unlocking Us. And even if you didn't listen to the podcast, come on down for a great conversation. Uh, the Global Branch Gathering is this Wednesday, the 22nd, via Zoom. Zoom, and everyone is welcome. We will also have an Ash Wednesday contemplative service on February 22nd at 7 p.m. This will be in person only due to tech constraints here in the ECC Chapel. Come usher in the season of Lent with us. And then our spring book study begins March 19th. 
Uh, we will be reading The Shift by Colby Martin. Get your copy. Sermons each week through April will cover chapters of this book, and Colby Martin will be joining us on April 30th as a guest preacher, and we'll hold a book signing discussion after the service. So for this and more details on our upcoming events, you can see the events tab on both our Facebook page and website, www.lefthandchurch.org slash events. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, beautiful. Let's stand together as each is able and willing and sing this song. Uh, you know, uh, there is actually a passage of scripture that suggests that God sings love songs over you and f over me. And I tend to think of this song as a beautiful imagining of, of that. So may we receive this invitation to allow God who is love to be our shepherd and our everlasting light. Amen. Let me be your everlasting light The sun when there is none I'm a shepherd for you and I'll go let me be your everlasting light. Oh, even when you can't see, I'm shining just for you. Together. Sending blessing, let's hear Psalm 23 again from the message. And I invite you to perhaps close your eyes or soften your gaze if it feels good. Hold out your hands as though you are receiving if that feels good to you. And trace each line like you are speaking these words yourself. God, my shepherd, I don't need a thing. You have bedded me down in lush meadows. You find me quiet pools to drink from. True to your word, you let me catch my breath and send me in the right direction. Even when the way goes through Death Valley, I am not afraid. When you walk at my side, I trust your trusty shepherd's crook makes me feel secure. You serve me a six-course dinner right in front of my enemies. 
You revive my drooping head. My cup brims with blessing. Your beauty and love chase after me every day of my life. I'm back home in the house of God for the rest of my life. Let's go in peace to love and serve God and one another. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let me be your everlasting light, the sun. I'm a shepherd for you, and I'll guide you through. Let me be your everlasting light. Let me be. Let me be your everlasting light. Once more. Let me be your everlasting light.